Welcome back everybody to Hearers of the Word and we're at the second Sunday in year B and so we'll go straight to the slides. So on the second Sunday of year B and our gospel is John 1 35 to 42. So here's our sequence for this presentation. Number one, reading and reactions. And we notice whatever strikes us as we read the gospel story today, right now. And then we look at the place of this story in the gospels, including comparisons with call stories in the synoptic gospels. And then we'll come to a close reading of the text to see the richness of this narrative and to let it speak to us today in our own lives. Before we get going, it might not be any harm to reflect on my own path of discipleship. And I've put a couple of pointers for reflection there. What draws me to the person of Jesus? How did it all start? What were the important moments? Who was there for me? What do I do to nourish my faith? And where do I find myself today on the path of discipleship? And above I have quote, a quotation from the spiritual writer John O'Donoghue, faith is helpless attraction to the divine. And to make it more concrete, here's a, a short reflection from Brother Roger of Taizé. He once wrote, like your disciples on the road to Emmaus, we are so often incapable of seeing that you, O Christ, are our companion on the way. But when our eyes are opened, we realize that you were speaking to us, even though perhaps we had forgotten you. Then the sign of our trust in you is that in our turn, we try to love, to forgive with you independent of our doubts or even our faith O Christ you are always there your love burns in our heart of hearts so the gospel for the second Sunday of the year is John 1 35 to 42 again the next day John was standing there with two of his disciples Gazing at Jesus as he walked by, he said, Look, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. Jesus turned round and saw them following him and said to them, What do you want? So they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? Jesus replied, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that whole day. Now it was about the tenth hour. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two disciples who heard what John had said and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, We have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. Simon looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. This, of course, is the year of Mark. And yet on the second Sunday, we're hearing from the Gospel of John. And this is because of an ancient tradition which combined three epiphanies, the Magi, the Baptism, and the Wedding Feast of Cana. And this threefold epiphany is still honored in the liturgy. And so in year A, we hear from John 1, 29 to 34. In year B, so our year, John 1, 35 to 42. And in year C, finally, John 2, 1 to 11, the Wedding Feast of Cana. Hence our gospel is from the Gospel of John, not as we might have expected from the Gospel 
of Mark. Then just to register a couple of quick reactions. Of course, there are call stories in the other Gospels, but this one in John's Gospel is actually very distinctive. There are, there's always a close link to John the Baptist. In the other Gospels too, John does send disciples to Jesus, but not to become his disciple, but to inquire about his identity. Andrew, Andrew is named in the other Gospels too, but is not at all prominent as he is in the fourth Gospel. And you will have felt the phrase in brackets, which is translated, which means that somehow the expressions or words were not understood by people who were reading the final edition of the fourth gospel and they needed some help. And also in our first reactions, we can notice what people are saying. On the lips of John the Baptist, look, the Lamb of God. On the lips of Jesus, what do you want? On the lips of Andrew, we have found the Messiah. Words spoken to Simon, you are Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas. And all these sentences are highly significant in our gospel passage. Now, a brief comparison. We'll take the example of the gospel of Mark, where there is, of course, a call story, which goes like this. Now, after John was imprisoned, Jesus went into Galilee and proclaimed the gospel of God. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the gospel. As he went along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and Andrew, Simon's brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will turn you into fishers of people. They left their nets immediately and followed him. Going on a little farther, he saw James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in their boat mending nets. Immediately he called them. They left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So again, we have the link with John the Baptist, but this time it's a link of timing rather than personal indication. And as in John's Gospel, there are two call stories here, Simon and Andrew, James and John, pairs of brothers. And in a sense, all four are equal, although Simon stroke Peter is mentioned first. All four seem to be fishermen. Simon and Andrew are called together. Now what's missing is there's no previous sense of quest or even experience of Jesus, although I suppose verses 14 and 15 are somehow pre presupposed. There is no human interest. We never find out about their wives, the children, or their motive for following Jesus. And there's no clue why these were chosen by Jesus himself. So many, many details that would be of interest to us are held back. And what stands out is the sovereign authority and command of Jesus to follow him. Now the call stories in John's Gospel are laid out somewhat differently. And we need to take a wider picture of the second part of chapter one after the prologue. And in John's Gospel, four days are counted. Day one is the testimony of John, that's chapter one, 19 to 28, which is about the identity and witness of John the Baptist. Day two is John 1, 29 to 34, the baptism of Jesus. I put baptism in inverted commas because you will notice that the baptism itself is not actually recounted. And day three is the call of Simon, another disciple, Anonymous, and Simon. And then day four is the call of Philip and Nathaniel. And then somewhat unexpectedly, the gospel says now on the third day, there was a wedding, which seems to uh, propel us forward to day seven, for the wedding feast of Cana. And all these scenes actually belong together, as we shall see. Days one and two clearly belong together, a kind of diptych or pair of stories. And days three and four clearly belong together, also a kind of diptych. Day seven, the wedding feast of Cana, brings the sequence to a climax. And these scenes in chapter one and in the beginning of chapter two 
form an important sequence which lays the foundation for the subsequent story of the ministry of Jesus. And closer analysis of the wedding feast of Cana makes one realize that that narrative corresponds to the proclamation of the kingdom of God in the other gospels. And it is worth noting that days one to four are full of titles, descriptions of Jesus. So that embedded in the story are many indications about his identity, as we shall see in the next couple of slides. Without reading the whole text, I'll take you through paragraph by paragraph. So in the first paragraph, three titles are mentioned, but in relation to John the Baptist, the Christ, Elijah and the prophet, categories of expectation at the time. In the second paragraph from John 1.23, these categories are repeated towards the end, but in verse 23, an important sentence is spoken. I am the voice of one shouting in the wilderness, make straight the way for the Lord. And the Lord here, originally in Isaiah, meaning God, indicates in John's gospel, Jesus. In the second, third paragraph, that's 126 onwards, you get some oblique descriptions, one whom you do not recognize, who is coming after me. In paragraph four, beginning with verse 29, we get the important sentence, look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, and the affirmation, he existed before me. And John says he came so that he could be revealed to Israel. And in the fifth paragraph, we get affirmations about Jesus and the Holy Spirit. John testified, I saw the Spirit descending like a dove. And then further on, this is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And then you get a very important affirmation. This is the chosen one of God, the elect of God. In the first paragraph here, beginning with verse uh, 35, we have um, the Lamb of God is repeated, and then the disciples use the term Rabbi of Jesus. From verse 40 onwards, uh, when Andrew goes to his brother, he says, we have found the Messiah, the focus of longing of Jews of the period, that is translated for the sake of the reader into Greek as Christ. In the paragraph beginning, verse 43, there's another long description one Moses wrote about in the law and the prophets, uh, Jesus of Nazareth. And there we get the immediate question of the origin of Jesus. Now the reader of this gospel already knows that the deep origin of Jesus is in God. In the beginning was the word, the word is with God, the word was God, the word was made flesh. Nathaniel makes a mistake of thinking physically of the origin of Jesus. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? The last paragraph, when Nathaniel and Jesus meet, then at the bottom there are two marvellous affirmations. Again, you have Rabbi, and then he is acclaimed as the Son of God and the King of Israel. So the writer of this gospel has filled the second part of chapter one with many, many indications of the identity of Jesus, all of which then come to fruition in the story of the wedding feast of Cana, and of course, further in the gospel itself. So we can begin to read John. Again the next day John was standing there with two of his disciples. Gazing at Jesus as he walked by he said look the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard him say this they followed Jesus. Jesus turned around and saw them following and said to them what do you want? So they said to him Rabbi which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus answered, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying and they stayed with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother, Simon, and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus Jesus looked at him and said, you are Simon, the son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. A few general comments on the whole scene. 
The link with John is there, this time not a timing link, but a sending link. Again, we have two call stories, Andrew and another, and then of the separate call story of Simon Peter in two parts. Andrew is the first called in, the, in John's Gospel, and he is so called in the Orthodox tradition, St. Andrew, the first called. There's no indication of their occupation. John is a disciple of the Baptist, and therefore somehow already engaged on a religious journey. And the writer assumes that Simon is interested in the coming Messiah. We have found the Messiah, which kind of seems to assume that he was already longing for or looking for the Messiah. And before Simon speaks, Jesus makes a prophecy about his identity by changing his name. Then we look at the story a little bit in detail. Again, the next day, John was standing there with two of his disciples, gazing at Jesus. As he walked by, he said, look, the Lamb of God. When John's two disciples heard him say this, they followed Jesus. So this is linked to the previous day's events and the various identifications there. There is uh, an intended contrast. John the Baptist is immobile and Jesus is on the move. So one person is static and one person is dynamic. So Lamb of God comes again for the second time. And John's disciples leave their prophet John and they follow Jesus. And this is uh, one of the foundational indications that the core group of the Joannine community were former followers of John the Baptist. The word follow, of course, is present in the synoptic tradition and a key term of discipleship in the Gospels. It comes back in the fourth gospel, kind of unexpectedly, in chapter 2, 21, verse 22, when the risen Jesus says to Simon Peter, you follow me. Jesus turned around and saw them following and said to them, what do you want? So they said to him, Rabbi, which is translated teacher, where are you staying? And Jesus answered, come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying. And they stayed with him that day. Now it was about the 10th hour. Now there are links between this passage and John chapter 20, 14 to 16, which I'll read. When she, that is Mary Magdalene, had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there. But she did not know that it was Jesus. And Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Who are you looking for? Because she thought he was the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have put him, and I will take him. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. So the, the links between those, these verses and the verses in John chapter 1 are the question, what do you want, whom are you looking for, the title Rabbi, Rabboni, and of course, the turning. And it's intriguing in John chapter 20 that Mary turns twice. And if we took that physically, she would now have her back to Jesus. But of course, the second turning is interior. The change from what do you want to whom are you looking for is profound. It means that the Christian proclamation is not a message or a thing, but a person. When the disciples ask, where are you staying? This is translated differently in different versions. It can also mean remaining, and in the older translation, abiding. Some translations tell us that it was now about four o'clock in the afternoon, which is missing a symbolic point. 10 is a number of completion, 10 commandments, 10 plagues, 10 trials of Abraham, and so forth. So the 10th hour is suggesting that something is coming to completion to the expectations of the Messiah. And timing is significant across this gospel. You have noon twice and the seventh hour. And later, of course, hour will have immense meaning this gospel because it will point to the moment of Jesus lifting up on the cross into resurrection. Andrew, the brother of Simon Peter, was one of the two disciples who heard what John said and followed Jesus. He first found his own brother Simon and told him, we have found the Messiah, which is translated Christ. Andrew brought Simon to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, 
you are Simon the son of John, you will be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. So Andrew is important in this gospel, turning up in, here in chapter 1, also in chapter 6 and in chapter 12. And again, I, we underline, he followed Jesus, so the foundational image of discipleship in the New Testament. Finding is also important in this gospel. And curiously, the verb turns up 19 times in this gospel, which is also full of quest stories. And intriguingly, there's a reverse order, Andrew first and then Simon, perhaps an anticipation of the lesser significance of Simon Peter for the fourth gospel and the greater significance of the beloved disciple. Simon is given that simple name in a few places in this gospel, Simon Peter rather more fully, and he's also called Peter as you can see from the references. Jesus changes his name and calls him the rock, um, even though no confession has been made, such as at Caesarea Philippi. So there's no reason given, and this Aramaic version of the name is used otherwise only in Paul's letters, intriguingly. So in chapter 1, 35 to 42, we have who is Jesus? This is the whole purpose of the Gospel of John, of course, with the many titles embedded in both parts of John chapter 1. This is also a gospel of quest stories, and this is our very first quest, the first disciples. But there are other significant quests in this gospel, Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the man born blind, and of course, Mary Magdalene at the end. And it is also a gospel about discipleship, and this is our opening scene of people becoming followers of Jesus. It will recur in chapter 21 where you have the final scene of conversation between Simon Peter and the risen Lord. And these are stories which of a twofold discovery. The discovery of Jesus, when people come to know who he is, and also the discovery of these people by Jesus himself. So there are two sides to the discovery and the discipleship role. We'd also note that in the fourth gospel, there are tremendously good questions. And notice that just a few of them here. The very first words that Jesus speaks in this gospel are, what are you looking for? What do you desire? Which is a great question to put to ourselves. Eh? And then the disciples ask him, where do you abide? But as the gospel unfolds, this is not his postal address or his postal code. But what's going on inside him and so it's a very different reality where are you most deeply at home so to speak might be a way of translating it and towards the end of the gospel story when uh, Jesus is on trial Pilate the great outsider asks really the very best questions about Jesus for instance he asks him are you the king of the Jews which is a good and important question he also asks him where are you from? Which has been a question rumbling around the gospel all along. And only Pilate asks a kind of open question. Where are you from? Of course, the gospel reader knows the deep origin of Jesus is not you know, Nazareth or Galilee, but in God. And Pilate also asks the question, what is truth? This is long after Jesus in this gospel has identified himself as the way, the truth, and the life and an echo of what began in the prologue grace and truth have come through Jesus Christ meaning not truth in terms of facticity but truth in terms of personal faithfulness and fidelity and then in chapter 20 Jesus asks Mary Magdalene whom are you looking for that great switch from what to who means that we're no longer preaching a message or a system or a religion but a person. So our scene here is part of a pattern of really life-giving questions across the fourth gospel. I put here the two really good questions. What are you looking for? John chapter 1 verse 38. And whom are you looking for? John 20 verse 15. 
So in this gospel, the teaching on discipleship is really a recognition of the hungers of the heart, the courage to be on a search or a quest or a pilgrimage or a journey, the important place of encounter with the risen Lord, and this encounter or calling is always carries with it a sense of mission. Once you have made the discovery, your desire is that others may make the same life-giving discovery that you have made yourself. And so we pray. From our earliest days, O God, you call us by name. Make our ears attentive to your voice, our spirits eager to respond, that having heard you in Jesus, your anointed one, we may draw others to be his disciples. We ask this through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. So thank you very much, everybody, for paying attention to this uh, short presentation. I hope you have found it helpful uh, and also a little intriguing because the fourth gospel is a wonderful gospel with many, many layers in the stories, as we just saw. So thank you very much, everybody.